catch up with our schedule. As you know, I'm, I'm going to be your master of ceremony for the next two days. We have valuable speakers, panelists here, and it's going to be a very active, very dynamic day, both for today and for tomorrow. So for today, let's go on. Let me introduce you our first speaker, Managing Risk in Crypto and DeFi, Mohamed Isaba, we're talking about this topic. He is the regional manager of Chain Analysis. So could you please welcome Mr. Mohamed Issa. How are you? Anybody know what is this sound for? Anybody knows? I don't think the new generation knows, but I do. It was the most beautiful sound that you ever hear as a teenager. Nobody knows what is this sound? One, two, wow, that's amazing. Great. Back at those days, there was a group they wanted to have independence for the internet and they actually they declare independence it's a very long uh, but you can check it on the internet the whole idea was we want to make sure that the internet is was only for us but imagine if it that happened i cannot check my bank account today i cannot pay my utility bill i cannot book an airline e-commerce that will be affected. So, today we're having crypto and we're having more and more legit investors coming. And we see even banks are coming into crypto. So the challenge here, we wanna be more open and we wanna understand how to encourage this. How can we work with different entities and not to keep it closed? And that's exactly our job. So let me introduce myself. My name is Isa, I work with Chanalysis. Anybody heard about Chanalysis before? Great, okay. So we work with different entities, usually government entities, exchanges, financial institutes, banks, regulators, to build trust in the blockchain, to get that kind of legit investors coming and working with you, to make those banks coming and allowing those kind of on-ramp and off-ramp of assets. We don't sell crypto projects. Yes, we do accept crypto as a payment, but we don't promote any crypto projects. So I'm here to discuss more and understand more how can we together build that kind of ecosystem and grow it together, especially that in Turkey there is a huge potential. So let's start from the very beginning. We see it's three, $3 tri trillion dollars of asset movement in crypto, and it's not only doubling, it's tripling within each and every year. But with this kind of opportunity, there's still a kind of a challenge because there are people who want to take those kind of opportunities from you, which is illicit activity related to the dark net market, related to terrorist group, and it's a lot. And I will show you by the number how it is. But those are a few. I have just a few hours ago a scam that happened. Anybody get here get scammed in his crypto wallet? No one? Come on, it happens. So that's what we want to do. We want to make sure it is clean. We want to make sure nobody is going to scam you or scam one of your relatives. We have lots and lots of cases that are happening every day and scamming is only one part of it. But there is ransomware, the child abuse, the terrorist group trying to use your innovative technology that we have it in that generation now. And we're in the center of the world. You can see some assets, and again, it's not about a certain country. We, I'm based out of Dubai. 
We have different uh, exchanges from different countries. We have from Russia. The case is not just from a certain country. The case is that you can be in a certain country, but you're actually getting your asset from the US or France, but it's coming from the darknet market. And you want to make sure that asset is clean. Whoever you're interacting with, that interaction is happening not from a stolen fund or terrorist group, but it's much more following the regulations in the country. And each and every country, they have their own regulation and uh, law enforcement guidelines. But let's talk specifically about Turkey. How do we see it? So it's number one across the Middle East when it comes to crypto adoption and the asset movement itself. And we're talking about $170 billion interacting in crypto in Turkey. And that's based on analytics and our team that analyzes the blockchain and give you that kind of understanding. Anybody can guess what is the percentage of illicit activity as a number? 7%. Okay. Anyone else? 7%. 1%. Okay. You're right. But even though that 1%, let's talk about what is it? It's $3 billion. And that $3 billion is not a small amount. So imagine you have your own wallet and you're interacting with an entity and that entity just scam you or you send you some asset that is coming from a terrorist group. And later on, you're trying to interact with, let's say, Binance or Kraken and suddenly they quarantine your asset. It happens a lot that you send them an asset and they tell you, sorry, it's, uh, it's related to a terrorist group. It's related to a scam. But yeah, but I got it and I already made the transfer. But you didn't know that asset is actually coming from illicit activity. That's what kind of data that we're providing, and usually those are to investors and exchanges. I know a lot of us here, maybe they're um, investors, they cannot have those kind of insight directly in our tool to understand what kind of illicit activity that their wallet is related, but working with exchanges that are regulated, they're working directly with, uh, with Chainalysis to get this data, it's much more reliable for you. Those data or those ransomware or those scams or any illicit activity is not just Chainalysis, investigators are doing that. We work with law enforcement. Take for example Turkey, We're, we work with the Turkish police to understand those kind of illicit activity and give it to you directly. So make it very simple, we give you the key to the government data. But the government wants you to see this data. They don't want you to interact with any illicit activity. So we have 1,500 as we speak investigator now checking what kind of illicit activity. And of course, if anybody gets scammed, the first step is to, law, to go to the law enforcement. You need to report because nobody will ever know that that's a scam wallet that's an entity that scammed you, unless that you can have that kind of reporting. And of course, you need to interact also with the exchange that you're working with. I hope that it's regulated and in-country, because it's kind of difficult that it's not in your own country. So those are the entities that we work with. We're talking about the law enforcement intelligence, because we work with the army also, because fighting terrorists is much more related, and it's related again to crypto which is the bad thing. They're trying to use the technology that you guys build and they're trying to use it in a very bad way. We, and with the ecosystem, we're trying to stop it together. Great, so the kind of insight that we give usually to the investors, we give it to, to, the, to the exchanges and lots of exchanges also uh, in the Middle East, they're working directly with us. It's even by the police case. So you can directly check if that's a dark net market, if that's a, a high risk exchange, and sometimes in a certain situation that you might have an exchange or a wallet, you're interacting with different entity and you don't see where this asset is coming from and suddenly your wallet is a high risky wallet. And if somebody, you're transferring any asset to that person, when he transfer it to um, a regulated exchange like Binance or Kraken, the amount will get quarantined. We don't want that. We want to make sure all of your asset that you have been receiving, all of your asset that you're sending, it's not related to illicit activity. Lots of people, they think it's in the blockchain, it's very hard to trace it. Crypto is much more transparent than fiat. And all the transaction happening in the blockchain will be there even for your grandkids to see it. 
Um, some cases we had to, to solve it, not only with uh, normal hackers, no, some cases that we have to solve it with government. So we go head to head with the Lazarus Group from North Korea. Anybody knows AXA Infinity? AXA Infinity, gaming company, get her for $600 million. So we work with them, and it was the Lazarus Group. So what we do also, we trace the funds, we can help certain governments and certain companies and exchanges and investors to trace the asset and to report it to the law enforcement for you to get that asset back. It looks very complicated, but anybody using Chainalysis and using our team to get that kind of training to investigate and understand where his asset coming from and where is it leaving. And that's the importance of it. The importance is you are not there So that is my presentation for today, but I'm always open for questions. Anybody have a question now? Still have one minute. Okay. I'm here today. I'm here tomorrow. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Thank you. Thank you very much for your speech. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. I can get it. It's okay. So thank you very much. Now let's go on. We will be talking about gerçekleşen rüyaların hikayesi. Let's talk about uh, the history story of the realizing dreams. Thank you very much. Welcome. So Hello. Introduce Hello. Okay. Yeah. All right. The, the sound system is also okay. If you need any sp um, for uh, for translations, you can get some headphones, and they are distributed right there in the back. So if you want to understand it better, uh, it's right there. Okay. You can Thank get you started. very much. Wow. Hey, <laughs> Ajan Libyan. It's exciting moment. I'm thankful for being here in a good time. Before starting, uh, my name is Zeki. I was born and raised in China, then UK afterwards. I'm the um, offline growth uh, manager, and it is the story of the realizing dreams. And I would like to talk about how the dreams turn into reality. So about dreams, I would like to mention the Mexi Global Lubasit Mexi Storm or this was a We are serving more than 170 countries in the world. Also, in our exchange market, we have more than 10 million users. And while realizing our dreams, we have to continue with certain steps. Here, we have three goals, aims, and also we have to mention amount, speed, and first of all, let's talk about quantity. It makes you global is one of the uh, mar uh, markets that publishes most amount of token projects, and 916 token projects are in our. Uh, market and with this our users are able to reach to potential investments uh, and popular projects and they can do this and participate in these by investing in Max G Global. I would like to mention about the speed 
speed and quantity goes hand in hand. I would like to mention token listing speed of the MEXC. We are famous in the market a bit, and this is thanks to the efforts of our listing team. It's by them finding the potential quality projects quickly, and thanks to their efforts, and we are listing projects, and while listing them, we have certain conditions, for example, legal compatibility and uh, society's understanding, the previous capital power of the members, the popularity, etc. And these are important facts about project distinct and makes the users name the makes see as the first stop at listing quality projects and makes see is able to list projects in high quantities and with high speed and as a last thing we have quality along with quantity everything has a quality a people has quantity a person has quality a company's quality, and I would like to mention the quality of the company, customer services of MEXG uh, and users are first chat with customer services, and in MEXG we have local customer services that works 24-7 and we res our customer service respond to our customers within 20 seconds even if you want you can call MEXG's customer services they return back to you ASAP and we have 97% customer satisfaction and I think that it's important for a market and while realizing the dreams while Writing this story, we have reached successes and we are giving gifts to our users. And this is that Mexi has lowest transaction cost in all of the market. This is the fifth year of Mexi. And this is Maxi's birthday, and Maxi is here in market with a good gift, and they have arrived with a big gift. As you can see, that market maker, market taker, uh, and we have the longest deferred payments, uh, and we are here to realize your dreams. I would like to mention the development strategies of Mexi and I think that is an important point. I have to mention that. I would like to mention this in a Turkey global and young focused manner. And I joined Mexi in 2000 and 21. I'm in Mexi Turkey for the last two years. They started to give way to Turkey back then and Mexi Turkey had four person in Mexi Turkey and now we are more than 40. We are doing beautiful work online offline activities, our campaign with our business partners. We are moving forward beautifully in Turkey. I would like to mention MX token. Our market provides importance to MX token and we are working on platforms that will implement MX token more and we also have MD Kickstart etc event and we, you can benefit uh, more with MX token 
and as you can see, I'm a young person, I'm 27, I'm in this stage, this is a beautiful, this is a big stage, I'm so happy to be in this kind of stage, I'm thankful to my market and as you can see, makes G support uh, young. Uh, we support young people. We are a young team. This is a young sector, and makes G Global wants that, and they support youngsters and rather be it global, be it um, global or local. We work together with young groups in universities. We have worked before and we continue working. We are supporting, we are continuing supporting the young people. And I would like to mention our successes in Turkey and my own team in Turkey. We are divided into three, customer services, business development and general operation and we have more than 40 uh, employees, we are a young team and in these two years we have accomplished much. The infrastructure of the uh, market, the, we have works in this kind, we are known market if you say makes it global everyone would know us we will continue working and our the third uh, our current liquidity our other services we are permanent in all of these also again I would like to mention uh, the young people they are saying that young people cannot do anything how can I entrust my money to young people actually young people has much power and if you can see that uh, the young people university students are participating in many events and we should support our young people more in our current situation and I think that Mexico Global are doing a good work in that manner and Mexico Global's doors are open to all of our young people. As a last thing, I would like to celebrate the fifth anniversary of Mexico Global and I'm inviting everyone to our booth. We have a different event in our booth for the fifth anniversary. Çok teşekkürler, sağ olun. So let's continue. We will continue with NFTs. Actually, it's a very important topic. How NFTs can help save the world of art from infringement. And our speaker, our valuable speaker, will be Mr. İlter Yılmaz. He is the ambassador of C.Poto in Turkey. So let's welcome him to the stage. Hoş geldiniz tekrar. Buna ihtiyacınız olacak mı? Merhaba, hoş geldiniz. Hello everyone, this presentation will be in English, but I wanted to start first in Turkish because this is my own country and the Mr. of Sita Photo. Now I go to England. Turkish ambassador of Sita Photo here in Istanbul, and I'll try to explain what we are doing and what we can contribute to the NFT photography society in the world. So, as you can see, Sita Photo is an NFT photo photograph space. And when you talk about photography, it's about art. And art makes reality bearable, according to Nietzsche. Actually, this quote is mentioned in many other philosophers and thinkers, but we chose Nietzsche because as a proponent of facial hair, look at that mustache. So this guy does this, so it should be true. So we move on. So we, we are a platform designed specifically for photographers by photographers. This means that when we made the platform, it was for photographers, for photographers' needs. So when you are in the industry, you know what are the shortcomings are. 
So we are trying to mitigate them all and make this a very seamless process for the collectors and the photographers. So what's an artistic work? You see Mona Lisa, it's an artistic work. All of, the, all of you know this. But the issue is, the only reason this is an artistic work is not because of the artist, it's because of the eyes that it, it sees it. In the end, when you produce art and you cannot reach it to the people that will appreciate it, it's for nothing. When you see Mona Lisa, you know it because everybody knows it. It's the same for every type of artistic work. So, let's move. So, another perfect mustache guy, James Mister says, an artist is not paid for his labor but for, for his vision. So, art is not about the tools that you use, it's not about the camera that you use, it's not about that perfect lens you bought while you sp spend a lot of money. It's about your vision, it's, sort of, it's about your imagination, it's about your eye. It's not just for photography, any type of art, it's all about the artist's vision. So, when you have an artist with a vision, with a product, and that art cannot reach you, it's for nothing. It's the general idea for everything. If you produce something, people should see it. So, the photography starts in the early 1800s, you all seen those Long exposure photos everybody, where everybody looks like they're dead. Now, thankfully for the digital camera, now we can take a lot of photos, a lot of different angles, and you can just delete the ones that you don't like. But not every photo is art. In the end, art is about vision and the artist. So, this is the first digital photography. This was a scan of Russell Kirsch. It's his son. He scanned the photo, an analog photo of his, and made it digital. And that makes photography the mother of digital art. And we, like every mother that we have, the mother has an issue. The main issue you have is what? This is an industry. And this industry faces a critical challenge. And the critical challenge is photography infringement. The main issue with the photography in digital age is you take a photo, you get it on the internet, and it's not yours anymore. As long as you don't have your signature on it, or as long as you don't have any, any chance to control it, it's gone. It can be copied, sold again, without your knowing. So photography infringement is the main issue, and we are trying to provide a solution for that. And the main solution for us is see that photo, because we are uh, photography, NFT platform. The name suggests it all. So when you use us, it means that your photography is saved somehow from copyright infringement. It's not all, but it will be there. So this is a start. So let's talk about the value of photographic assets for digital art industry and the art collectors. So as an artist, when you have your photo, and you mint it on a blockchain and add it to a platform, and when you try to show it to the collectors, the value is not just about the price tag. It's about appreciation of the art, because the main idea of the art is the artist should have someone backing them up. If you like a person's art, there are many ways to support it. One of them is to buy it, if you have the means. The other one is to follow him or her. Or another way can be just talking about that person. Because the artist needs some food to carry on providing art. So you, if you like an artist's work, you need to support it. That's the main idea. So when you think about collecting art, is a way to invest in yourself and your future. So when you think about art, people usually think about paintings. And you know how paintings work. Uh, you just buy it when the guy is alive and when he's dead, it makes money and you're fine. It's the same idea with photography because the main issue with photography is it's like the black sheep of the art industry because when you have a painting, you feel like the, there's a labor behind it, there's an idea behind it. It's the same for, way for photography because you can just go ahead, go to the place, one of the most famous photographs that you've ever seen and try to take the same thing. It will not be the same because there's an artist between that. If you are an artist, you'll have another eye. But that famous photo that you see is not just a square. 
So this intellectual property rights for photographers is supported by us, and I will explain how it goes on. But the idea is, if you are consuming art without supporting this intellectual property rights for photographers or any artist that you are consuming, there's a great chance that you will not be able to consume it anymore because it will be gone. Let's talk about an analogy of ownership. So if I come to you and tell you I'll have a, I have a piece of pro land in Dubai or in Istanbul and I'm giving it to you, just do whatever with it. And you start building your project and say in six months the project is half done and we have a fight. Say you try to share my food. I never share my food. And I say, okay, just get out. You have to get out because you don't have the title deed. If you have the title deed, even if you try to share my food, the land is yours and you can use it. But if you don't have it, you can lose it anytime. So this title deed can be provided by the blockchain technology over NFTs and we are the place to do it. So now there's another issue in the art world. This AI machines will create digital art for you. But as I said before, art is only done from the artist's vision. You cannot just take a machine and create art. You just create a mambo jumbo of the art that was produced before. And but you have, you can say, I want Michael Jordan riding on a monkey going to Mars. You can have that photo. But the issue is that's not art. That's just collage of things that was done before. So the difference between AI art and the genuine art is the human element in between. So what we think is AI will fade out worthless NFTs, which means AI will, will work both ways. One, to produce mambo jumbo, and the second one, it will just fade it out because this AI in the future will see if the art is genuine or not. But as a platform, we are not against AI because we use it in our platform. But not to produce art. We are using AI for the artist to make description for their photos. Because in our platform, we have the, one of the most strongest, let's say, KYC procedures. Now you'll say when you have KYC, it shouldn't be decentralized. It's not because we have to know who the artist is to know the art is genuine. That's the issue. So we only collect and showcase genuine art through KYC and our history checks and our award checks. We know that anyone that is exhibiting their art in our platform is a genuine artist. <coughs> so our goal is to establish ourselves as leading authority in photography in the digital area. What does that mean? For me personally, if in the next two years, a photographer goes to a convention and says, I am a photographer, it means something. That is the goal. So that's what we are aiming for. So, or one of our strongest suites is we have our dedicated IPFS. So IPFS is the way to share and store data. You can have it shared or dedicated. When you have it dedicated, it's yours. When it's shared, it's rented. The, on, the main reason we lose NFTs is people use shared IPFS, but we have only dedicated. So I'm going a little bit faster because the time is going on. I will go again. Here is our NFT title. When you procure an NFT from our platform, this is, this is what you can download. And when you want to exchange it with someone else, you can use that too. So we are generally zero cost for the artist because when they come in and mint their photos in our uh, platform, they are rebated by seed tokens since our platform can only be accessed through wallets, MetaMask, and whatever you spend on gas fees, you'll get back as seed tokens and go back to your wallet and exchange it with whatever crypto you want. So that's the I think I was explaining, it's, you can swap it. And we have multi-chain support. We, you can do it through BNB chain, Ethereum, or Polygon. So the artist is free over there. And we have a chat function. Since our uh, platform can be accessed through wallets, whoever is in chat and you are talking to, you know that the person is genuine. And whenever the guy comes back 
and see his chats from back then, he can just access it again. This is one new thing I have to explain, but time, my time is running out, so I'll be a bit faster. And we have a museum thing that's going on where you can see your when, where you can stake your NFTs, where you will just buy an NFT for say 10 BNB, and if you borrow it back to our museum, you'll get 20% almost of it instantly back, and we'll use the NFT that you have in the worldwide galleries that we are promoting ourselves. So we promote, promote photographers world, worldwide through our galleries, the physical ones, because since we, we are not just NFT and we are not just for digital, we can go physical also. We did this in Istanbul, in Milan before, and in the next year, every quarter, we'll have, have another one in another city. So we'll have articles and news agencies and social media, which is just marketing for everyone. So we have paid marketing options for the artists, which means you can share your income with the platform, and the platform will do your marketing for free, because everybody knows, even if you produce life, if you cannot market it, you will not be able to sell anything. And we have exclusive projects for our artists, where we collaborate together with a vision. They do their art, we do the marketing. So we are the most exclusive photography NFT marketplace. So, and this I explained again. And just this is what we are imagining, where intellectual property rights are better protected than now. So I was a bit faster in the last part because this was a 15-minute presentation, so we dropped to 10. Thank you for listening, and have a good day. Thank you very much. Awesome, <laughs> solid. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Iltar Yilmaz from Photo. He's also the ambassador of Photo in Turkey. Now we'll have a very dynamic panel right now. And first, I would like to introduce you our moderator for this session. Please welcome Mr. Ms. Julia Motorina to moderate this panel. Please, Julia, come here. The stage is all yours. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, uh, hey everyone, we are ready to kick off our discussion on web free gaming, uh, its opportunities and challenges. Uh, and let me welcome the participants on the stage, guys. So, we have Mustafa, co founder at Waker Games. Please. Hello, everyone. Uh -huh. Yeah, you can. See. Okay. So we also have Ulas Jan, co-founder at NFT Horizon. <laughs> okay, it's pleasure to have you on stage. We are just waiting for one more panelist. Just give us a couple of seconds. Yeah, so we also have Nishant, founder at Expand My Business. Welcome. Yeah, oh, there, there. Ah, okay. Okay, let me introduce myself shortly. My name is Julia. I'm a global recruiting team leader at Bean Crypto, which is the top free crypto media. And I'm sure I had some interviews with you guys because more uh, than the year, I'm focused on hunting best web free specialists on the crypto market and especially C level managers. So, can you guys also please introduce yourself, say a couple of words, and what we should expect of our panel discussion? Yeah, uh, my name is Mustafa Miral, but I'm a co-founder of Waker Games. Uh, we have uh, released our eight games uh, in this uh, six months, and we uh, are uh, switching to Web 2 to Web 3 gaming. And uh, I wanna add something to Web 3 to our uh, my experience in Web 2. 
Okay, okay, amazing. Next one, please. So, hello everyone, and I am Ulaş Can Deniz Genç. I am the co-founder of NFT Horizon, uh, which is a media outlet. At the same time, we are a drop NFT aggregator. And I have been in the crypto space since 2017, and the NFT space for the last three years. And that's all, that's the critics. Okay, okay, thank you. Nishant? Oh, hi, good afternoon everybody. I am Nishant Behel, I am the founder for Expand My Business. Expand My Business is Asia's largest technology company for uh, blockchain, software development, and marketing solutions. We raised $20 million from the world's top investors, such as DST Global, Alpha Wave, Falcon Edge, the Abu Dhabi government. And we have already served more than 4,000 buyers across 20 countries. And uh, the vision for us is very simple. If you are looking to outsource any of your uh, development work, be it Web2, Web3, uh, we are the organization to do it for you. Okay, thank you, thank you guys. Okay, so Web3 Gaming has come a long way in the past few years, undergoing significant changes. We've witnessed uh, developments of new models, NFT integration. We have created a vibrant ecosystem of Web3 games, reshaping how players engage in and interact with virtual worlds. And let's start from the overview of Web3 Gaming, and in particular, its current state. Emir, how do you see the present condition of Web3 Gaming and how has it evolved over the past few years? Web3 Games uh, in, is still in the beginning of our, uh, his journey, so uh, I think it will develop much farther, with the, uh, but we need to fix the, like, understand better of it. Just, I think uh, we started to understand how to utilize NFT in games better and uh, much more like new utilities uh, mm -hmm. come every day. So uh, I think it's currently just uh, like, like a baby. So mm -hmm. I think if we uh, look at well and uh, do the uh, right move to the uh, future, I think it will be the uh, biggest thing in the world. But right now, I think currently uh, it needs uh, love, you know. Okay, okay. So, and you have mentioned also about your experience with Web2 games. So, what do you personally want to uh, bring to Web3 gaming? Yeah, uh, firstly, I want to, to traditional gamers to uh, start using the wallets and yeah. uh, contribute to NFT space and crypto market. But uh, right now, they are, I think, scared to join any uh, Web3 games because uh, when you see any Web3 games, they ask you wallet in the first time when you open the game. So they're scared to open it, you know? Like, they think, like, why should I open a wallet? How much it takes? Uh, he is not, she's not sure of it, how to do it. And uh, we look like that right now, that uh, Web3 game is all about play to earn. I think this needs to change about Web3 game because uh, games for fun. You know, uh, gamers play games for fun, and right now I think um, like most of the games looking like to uh, play game and earn something, but it's really hard to earn something when you're playing game. You know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I agree with you. Okay, Nishant, what are your thoughts on this? Okay, so I, I could also add some points in here. Okay. So, um, before all the thing, what was happened? I mean, this is a critical question because if we understand something history, we can more accurately predict its future. Yeah. So it is, it is important to look back. So actually, before the gaming, we also look at the crypto space. I mean, it, it, is, it, have, it has a four stage, right? The innovation period, the mania, the hype, and we see uh, a big crush and the adjustment. And this is the cycling. Mm -hmm. And actually, the NFTs or the gaming space, they all correlate uh, in the crypto world with this concept. So for the NFTs, I mean, when it was first uh, initiated, I mean, when is the first NFT created? I mean, it is 2014. And we see the NFTs become mainstream in the 2021. So what was happening? I mean, there. So actually, uh, creating a game is not an easy thing. I mean, you need all the budget, you need all the team and creativity, and and people realize that okay, before the before the game, we can we can also create some collectibles, and it is easy, and people react that. 
So it all started with the art and collectibles, and then we see in the gaming uh, stage as well. And the peak part, uh, of course, there's lots of venture capitalists in here as well, I believe. Um, all the money flow came into this space. And personally, I mean, I work with over 300 DApps in the gaming space, in the crypto world. So we see that lots of the money, um, lots of the big money uh, flow into the uh, very crazy projects. I mean, um, the owners even don't know how to handle that much amount of money. I mean, ventures even don't know how to spell the blockchain. I mean, we saw all the things and there's a sudden crash in there. Of course, there's lots of uh, success case. I mean, there's a few success case there. So in the gaming side, um, it started with like that. There's a proof of concept. I mean, it all started with the proof of concept because you don't know um, how the community react in the first place. So you first create some community, first the community, and okay, there's an interest. So people start to design a game, and maybe perfect and not perfect, and they put on the stage, and then they started looking for a partnerships. So this is the first what, what, what was happened. And secondly, okay, they know there's an interest. So they first designed the game, they put the game, and then community build, and then they need to grow, and they are looking for a partnership. This is the second phase. And now what we are seeing today in the gaming side, there is first the partnership. I mean, there's lots of big IPs coming from there and with a lot of partnerships. And then they initiate the game and as in the traditional way, maybe. And then community will around, gather around those games. I mean, this is the, what is happening now. Yeah, yeah, definitely got it. Okay, Nishant, what, is, what do you think about this topic? about the current state? So, you know, um, for me, I think it has been largely very uh, personal and it's, it's a beautiful thing to, you know, witness because um, myself, you know, I have been a gaming fanatic for the longest time, uh, spent my entire engineering, you know, spending time on my laptop, my, uh, you know, PlayStation. So, you know, witnessing this entire change is something very beautiful for me. But uh, for me, you know, as a technologist, uh, I think one thing I'm obsessed about is the interoperability of the entire function, right? Like earlier, you know, there used to be very confined ways in which, you know, how we could uh, play games, how we could probably use assets. But because the way uh, the Web3 is changing the entire gaming industry, I feel the way, you know, we are able to use the assets, the way we are able to use tokens, the way we are able to use NFTs across the value chain of different games, that is something superb, you know, which we are witnessing. The second thing is I, I also feel that, you know, the way, uh, Metaverse and immersive tech is playing a, a very, very crucial role in the way gaming as a sector is evolving, right? For the longest time, if you look uh, throughout the journey of Web 2.0, uh, the immersive experience in most of the games was largely missing, right? So with Metaverse coming in, with, you know, a very strong evolution of uh, the VR, AR, MR taking place, uh, I think it's, it's a time to witness how the next five years of, you know, gaming is going to be looked upon, but largely, Overall, uh, the way this entire ecosystem is shaping up, uh, the current industry size is about 170 odd billion dollars. But uh, the larger analysis, uh, you know, reflects that because of Web3 playing such an important role in the gaming industry, the industry is sized to be about 300, 350 billion dollars by the end of five years. Okay, yeah. But, you know, even having all this, all this state, uh, having all these advancements, so there are still several major challenges uh, right now. For example, Amir, you mentioned about wallets. So there is a choice between custodial and non-custodial wallets. Native in-game um, web-free integration for popular game engines such as Unity and Unreal Engine is in dire need. We also have the major dilemma on decentralization with the question of which parts of the game should be on-chain and which are off-chain. So based on that, uh, Amir, what are the innovations that we should expect to see in Web3 Gaming in the next five years? I think Web3 Gaming, like uh, innovations that have, like adding to all the games, I think that the, and connecting it, uh, all of them is a big part of the uh, old blockchain uh, system and economy. But uh, you see, um, I think all games should have it, but as a future, like a, uh, I think a small part should be the uh, blockchain 
why? Yeah. Let me tell you. Uh, I think gaming industry doesn't need blockchain and, and uh, uh, NFT and all that. Gamers need it. Gamers want to have ownership of their assets. And uh, we want that the gamers uh, will be use it and uh, like the innovations that are for uh, like easy to integrate and they can uh, fastly connect their uh, wallet and address as well. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, Ulushan, uh so what impact all these innovations, maybe you can also add some innovation that you can expect, so what impact that will so have on the wider gaming industry? So what is next? I mean, yeah. this, is, this is the critical question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So actually, um, the blockchain gaming and NFTs, I am also always saying that this uh, is uh, all connected because it is the history. Like we have digital assets and we know NFTs, the revolutionary version. So every new revolutionary technology hit the market twice. So we see that the first time um, the blockchain gaming hit the market. and. Okay, people realize that, okay, there's something in, going on in here. So lots of developers coming, lots of studios coming. So we will see the second phase. So what will happen in the second, second phase? In the, in the current version, we currently have, in the previous years, over $10 billion investment made to blockchain gaming. So, but in the currently, we have life, uh, five over the... 5% live games in the current phase. I mean, very small percentage is live, so we can interact with them. So in the upcoming period, we will see this percentage go like half to half. So uh, lots of big IPs currently working on, um, I mean, currently working on this area, and we will see those games. And the critical part is that currently crypto, crypto world is not that much popular, actually. We have like yeah. Yeah. 30 million people in here and look at the games i mean games will be the next big thing for the crypto because even one game like PUBG have uh, has a uh, hundred million players monthly so at the peak they have billion people uh, play at some point so even one game can create huge impact in the blockchain world even so how? Because it is easy. I mean, you can you can just play some game because it is fun, and you can learn in the in the parallel how the wallet system works, how the blockchain things, the investment strategies. I mean, all the things coming uh, with the this uh, this gaming uh, segment. So uh, we probably see lots of big IPs. Like I, I can give some couple of examples. Like okay. Epic Games. Epic Games is really like the space, right? Of course, I am always spectacular with the big IP. I mean, I, I always telling that in the previous years, like two to three years ago, I said that, okay, you are all telling that Meta is pioneering space, right? And what will happen? I mean, they first tell that, okay, we will get a half of the fee, and then, okay, we will not uh, make it for a couple of years, and then we will get the fee, and then, okay, we are pulling back the, uh, the technological investment. I mean, we are laying off the things. So, okay, Epix is going great. And they say that they have 20 new games coming in the blockchain area. And then we are looking at Fortnite. I mean, Fortnite announced that um, Fortnite Creative 2.0. It is really important because it is based on user-generative content, right? Uh, UGC. So it is very critical because it is a direct match with the, this technology, I mean. Because you can create sub-economies under the games. I mean, you can... You can earn your own money with creating uh, your content, and it it also shows you the importance of ownership. Ownership is also critical because it is all about the property rights. When we look at the countries with high GDP, GDP, GDPs, we are seeing that high, um, the biggest countries have uh, highest property rights. So it is very critical. Uh, critical. Um, utility of the, the gaming space, the NFTs. And also, one last example, uh, there's a company called CCP, maybe you know the EV, EV online game, very popular game, and they get uh, investment le le lead by A16, like $40 million, and they plan to launch EV Web3 game. And I mean, when these kind of projects, like Sharapnel or other type of the big, uh, big companies, uh, big studios, initiated 
uh, their project. I mean, we will see the rush in to the uh, to gaming, ga Web3 gaming area, and uh, of course, the crypto itself. Yeah, totally makes sense. Makes sense. Okay, Nishant, uh, what do you think about the innovations and its impact on the wider gaming community? Uh, so for me, I think one of the innovations we have been noticing in the industry is, uh, you know, uh, how do people monetize, uh, you know, gaming? So a lot of people, you know, who have been avid gamers now of late because of, you know, blockchain platforms, you know, have been able to monetize these platforms. You know, their people have been able to make money in the real world from these platforms. So that, I think that is one emergence which we are seeing in the industry, which is very, very dominating. Uh, the second is... Um, the uh, in asset purchases based on blockchain right so a lot of you know uh, uh, asset purchases which typically you know form one of the underlying mechanisms of monetization in the gaming industry right are again moving to blockchain so um, we uh, you know again following the industry very very closely this is something we are witnessing right now and something we are hoping for that this industry goes on to become uh, larger with time uh, that's the second thing the third thing, uh, you know, uh, one thing which we have also started noticing, right, the user-generated content, you know, as he was mentioning, right, th this is something which is really picking up. Now, what we are seeing, a classical difference between the gaming in Web 2.0 and Web 3.0, uh, Web 3.0 is, in Web 3.0, a lot of developers are using, you know, open source communities, which is very, very closely knitted with user feedback to, you know, launch the next version. So this is something, you know, which is a very, very positive change. And again, you know, as the user-generated content keeps on, you know, becoming bigger and bigger, it's a very strong compounded effect which we are going to see across the gaming industry. Yeah, got it. I'd also add that uh, it's crucial for growing the industry is refining the first-time user experience. As many developers say that this is what best determines whether a player uh, stays in place or leaves and never, never to return. And in 2022, we saw the huge 60% increase in daily unique active wallets compared to 2021 numbers. And it was 1.13 million. So many top games uh, saw this increase. So, Lechan, how can game developers attract more traditional gamers to web free games? What should be done? Yes, actually, this is the uh, this is the one critical uh, maybe issue, uh, but uh, it is not directly the case. The like throwing the Web3 version to the traditional uh, gamers. I mean, it's not work like that. I mean, they reject this kind of things. So, um, actually, one critical things as I mentioned, uh, the high quality games need to come into the place, right? This is the one critical things. So when those games is uh, come to the place, I mean, lots of the users directly uh, start to onboard uh, this kind of games. And also, I mean, when, when we think onboarding, uh, I mean, you cannot say directly, okay, if you want to play this game, go get some MetaMask account. I mean, <laughs> it, it is a hurdle, right? I mean, it is not a easy. So the gamers ha hate those kind of things. I mean, we, we are okay with that, but gamers not. I mean, so as I, First, say the partnership also key in this area. So, uh, partnership with onboarding uh, or in the in the place of onboarding stages or any other stages will help those kind of things. I mean, you can partner with some uh, infrastructure or some projects that make people easily onboard the gaming space. Like they can easily create uh, with email account, and in the background you can create some private keys, public keys, all the all the um, all the hurdle you can do in the background. Just uh, and you can also create. I mean, lots of the lots of the studios. I mean, that I talk with. I mean, they are saying that um, it is not easy to uh, getting feedback as well. I mean, there's lots of problem in this area because you are giving incentives, right? So uh, when you are giving incentives, people directly react to those incentives, the money itself, especially. So. You cannot track the real feedbacks, the real analytics. So, lots of the game also try to solve this problem with uh, doing um, like free-to-play option, or they are giving the first game part and they are um, giving some optional uh, web three areas. And um, these kind of uh, these kind of things will make uh, traditional gamers 
uh, attract here uh, and more, I mean. Okay, so you also have mentioned uh, about onboarding. So I'm, I'm just thinking that other companies can also, help, can also help, like not gaming companies, can help onboarding the users, can tell more, can educate them about the wallets and all this stuff. So do you think it's possible and do you think like, do you see some companies who make some efforts on doing this? Yes, of course, I mean, uh, the gaming itself, I mean, when we when first interact with games, it gives you some tutorial, right? Yeah. So we need to educate people ab about uh, uh, about this new technology, and gaming is a very good place because it also have it is uh, inner ability to uh, make them learn. So it's okay. a very good opportunity. Yeah. Okay, Emir, uh, as a gamer, uh, yes. as, a, uh, as a developer, um, what can you say about these topics? And not only about like attracting, like what innovations and what strategies do do we need to make here? Yeah, I think the uh, like uh, as you mentioned, like the entrance is the big part of the because when you show the wallet, as I mentioned that before, yes. like uh, they get scared and leave it immediately. But I think uh, not the uh, if, uh, if you give the first part of the game the player, I think that's not enough either because uh, I want to invest more. I want like, uh, as you mentioned, like Fortnite, like PUBG, uh, they are all free game, uh, full uh, free. Like you can play it like uh, your whole time and didn't like you did not need to uh, buy anything. Like uh, I think. Uh, this has changed though, for the like most of the NFT games I see. You need to buy something first. Yeah, why should I buy something that uh, maybe I don't even enjoy it first place? You know, uh, I think like uh, also the gaming industry is switching to the uh, freemium uh, things. Uh, so I think uh, Web3 games can switch as well uh, for the first start. And uh, you know, like most like Clash of Clans is a big example. I think for the mobile web 2 game uh, is really huge right now uh, like like uh, uh, and it's so free and they earn their money just 1% uh, in the end they like earn uh, lots of money with that strategy uh, i think uh, something can be done uh, like this uh, in for web 3 okay Yes. I also remember what uh, Robbie Ferguson, uh, the co-founder of Immutable, tweeted in the beginning of this year in uh, January. So that we can expect the next wave of public adoption with some uh, viral web-free game that will catalyze this. Uh, so, and it will most certainly happen in the next year, year and a half. So what do you think about this also? Like, can there be one like viral game? Yeah, uh, I think like uh, like th these games can be switched and when they switch to the type of like Clash of Clans, when they switch to Web3, I think this will be huge for the Web3 environment. Okay, okay, yeah. So uh, you have also mentioned, and I think that many specialists on the market say that onboarding challenges and player accessibility are the biggest issues within the sector, and especially user experience play the crucial role here. So we still have to make some strides for web-free game developments, even despite the fact that there has been considerable, uh, considerable progress with tools and documentation to facilitate smart contract development, thanks to DeFi. So in this regard, what specific challenges do game developers and designers face when working with existing smart contract and NFT standards, and how this can be addressed? Emir, maybe you can start. Yeah, uh, this is actually like, because this is a new, very new technology, and uh, not uh, lots of developers adopt it and learn it how to use it effectively, and uh, and the game designers and uh, other jobs as well for the game development part. Uh, but I think, like uh, for time being, we need to experiment more, try new things, and uh, when we do something like uh, experiment in, in the futures of the Web3 game. Uh, I think we, they will adapt fast, uh, but for that, I, uh, we firstly make Web3 games more uh, suitable for Web2 gamers. You see. Okay. Uh, okay. Because, uh, like, let me add something as well. Uh, like, managing like tokens is hard for the game designer as well right now because mm -hmm. they don't know how it works. You know, uh, because it's a new thing. Maybe uh, 
uh, experienced game designers don't know how to place the token usage of their game because uh, this is actually real money can be swapped as well. So uh, I think they, they need lots of experience and uh, experiment as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You have also like mentioned, and it connects with that there is a shortage of uh, good, like skilled web free developers. So we should also think about it. It's, it's also the issue on the market. Yeah, like it's, companies it's can attract these talents. Time will solve it because yeah. it's a new technology and. Uh, as a time being, the more people are going to learn it uh, as we grow the space. So I think uh, in the future, like, uh, this is not going to be a problem for the Web3 games. So how many years? How would you say? <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that. I, should, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe one, maybe six months. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. So Nishant, uh, what do you think about this topic? What are the challenges with smart contracts and NFT standards? Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is definitely going to be the scalability and the gas fees, right? Uh, so again, this is something which has been largely discussed across the community. How do we solve for uh, increasing uh, gas fees? And of course, you know, as uh, I think, as you know, the scalability keeps on growing up. Uh, one of one of the things which has definitely come across in the recent past is, you know, using protocols of layer two, using um, you know, sharding as, in, uh, as a concept using uh, Ethereum 2.0, you know, they, there are evolutions to, you know, how we can probably do that. And of course, you know, uh, the direct implication of carbon footprint is something, you know, we should be all concerned about. So uh, that, in my opinion, is, I think, one of the biggest, uh, you know, biggest concerns on how we should be tackli uh, tackling it. But, you know, having said that, uh, they, there is enough and more research going on, you know, on what could be the next step to solve this. The second, I, I, I think, you know, which is a larger concern for every, everybody is that uh, the regulatory compliances, right? Of course, we, you know, in the coming times, we are going to see, uh, you know, DAOs being m much more prevalent. But I also feel at the same time, you know, the developer communities and the people, you know, involved uh, deeply in the ecosystem should be monitoring the government regulations very closely with respect to, you know, the legal implications as well. Because, of course, you know, uh, throughout, throughout the day, there has been a lot of discussion about, you know, how uh, the Web3 is also sometimes looked upon in the bad, uh, bad light, right? So I think these are uh, the larger two challenges at hand. Apart from that, of course, there are, you know, several other challenges. But uh, in my opinion, the, you know, couple of challenges I mentioned, the scalability with respect to the gas fees, plus uh, the regulatory compliances. I think these are the larger topics that, uh, uh, uh, you know, the larger issues at hand right now. Yeah, you have mentioned important points about the challenges. Okay, so Uwes Chan, what do you think about this? Okay. So, I mean, I, I work with many gaming studios as an advisor and all this stuff. So I see lots of the problem in the space. I mean, uh, there's lots of hard things to do. And of course, the user amount is the, one of the critical things because games are generally uh, designed for a uh, huge amount of players. So, but uh, I mean, if you are not a star game, I mean, you, can, you probably not solve this problem directly. But the other, other problems, um, the one thing is that, uh, as, as, as, as, as he talked, and the cost of the transactions. I mean, mm -hmm. even we have the layer twos or um, the, the direct blockchains to handle these kind of transactions, but it is still a problem. So uh, this one is the one of the, criti uh, one of the critical part. And the other type of problem is that, um, I mean, in the Web2 gaming, we have all the tools. We have all the things. So um, when a developer or gaming studio jump into the blockchain space, they directly ask that, OK, what is the Web3 version of this tool? So <laughs> I mean, e either there is none or there is a new one, the new startup doing this kind of tool. So I mean, this is the one uh, critical things because I mean, in the gaming space, like think about mobile, they are just optimizing the one bottom, bottom or one thing. And, and this is a whole new thing. I mean, I mean there is uh, lots of tool that they need and the other side um, they also they also need SDKs so I mean most of the developers or gaming studios not directly want to hard code everything so, I mean um, lots of the developers using APIs and that bunch of stuff so we also need that kind of uh, infrastructure level uh, solutions to uh, make the process easy so this is also uh, another another critical uh, problem and 
Of course, as I mentioned earlier, the incentives is, is, can be a problem because you cannot collect the real data that, I mean, even that is a hurdle, people play that game to just get the money. So this can be also a problem, so you need to design very carefully. And for doing all of this stuff, you need the knowledge. So this is, knowledge is the very big problem. So what is knowledge? Security in the blockchain, knowledge. Um, designing your game is knowledge. So there's lots of different area under the knowledge. Of course, I am not saying that all the, all the developers or gaming studios solve this problem directly themselves. So partnerships uh, can be very, um, very helpful on this kind of uh, creating this kind of knowledge inside of the, of the projects. So these are the um, current uh, problems and possible solutions actually is on the table. Okay, yes. So we also uh, have been mentioning uh, about attracting traditional gamers, and there is a huge topic about user experience. So what do you think, what are the implications of prioritizing user experience over decentralization in web free gaming? Amir, can you answer this? Yeah. Uh, for the, the web 2 gamers experience, like think like that, games made uh, for the enjoyment of the player. So uh, firstly, like, uh, there shouldn't be just, uh, uh, what I can say, like there should be a gameplay that can, a gameplay loop and can be playable uh, with the sense. You know, I, uh, early stages of Web3, I saw some games just, you idle and watch it, and it's ju not just a game, you know, this is not a game. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you see the Web2 games, uh, they, uh, uh, especially in the big companies, uh, they made uh, amazing stuff, and uh, they really prioritize how gamers feel, how they interact uh, with, with their game, and how uh, they they can uh, have fun in their game for the gamers. I think uh, we a uh, Web3 space right now is lack of game design, that good, good game design and really good fun experience in game in general. Uh, and we can fix it with like much better uh, Web3 uh, game design. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, like there is a lot of uh, problem needs to be solved. Like first, I think we need to solve those problems. Like security is a huge risk for Web3 games, uh, and uh, it mentions some uh, other things uh, that needs to be solved. I think when they are solved, we can work more of the game design and how we can uh, make better games faster. And then we can uh, prioritize the uh, uh, user's experience with it. Okay, okay, got it. Ulaşan, what do you think about user experience versus decentralization in the gaming industry? Okay, so we are talking about uh, we should first put uh, some Web2 utilities or yes. decentralization first, right? Yeah. I believe that um, it, it, is, it is not a best case to do, to fake it, I mean. Mm -hmm. So we need to, we need to, we, need, we, we don't need to uh, put back the decentralization, I mean. We can still uh, use it in a, in a correct way because user can understand that, I mean, user will understand that. As we see Ubisoft itself in the space, but they co created a Quartz program, they put some NFTs in uh, one game, and crypto space rejected, and traditional gamer also rejected, because it published like uh, pages of pages of restriction for the NFTs and digital assets. So you cannot directly fake it, this area. But of course, as we talked earlier, I mean, uh, you can create great game as in the tra traditional version. You can, uh, you can onboard people in an easy way. And in the background, you need to handle decentralization. So you cannot uh, omit those areas to just to onboard more people or the traditional ones. I mean, it's not work like that. I mean, um, people reject that. I mean, the crypto space boat, the traditional boat. Okay. Okay, yeah. So I think that we all agree on the challenges and on the innovations that we should expect in the near future for web free gaming, especially to attract traditional gamers here. So 
yeah, just to sum it up, uh, web free gaming has evolved significantly in recent years, showcasing the potential of player owned economies and uh, tradable assets. And in the next five years, we can expect some innovations as, uh, I don't know, improved gameplay mechanics, a seamless integration of web free features, and also the emergence of new genres. So, and these advancements should definitely attract traditional gamers and have a profound impact on the wider gaming community, right? Okay, amazing. So, I think we don't have much time left. Thank you a lot for our, to our panelists. It was amazing discussion. Yes, yeah, yeah, and Thank you too. I hope that the web free gaming industry will thrive in the recent years. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much, Julia, and your valuable speakers. Thank you.